is up everybody welcome back to another episode of the format podcast today i got a very special guest someone who's been uh, instrumental to me in my journey in the sports media and uh someone who I've, I've had the pleasure to be around and that's uh coach Derek gibbs head coach of the university of north florida my alma mater women's basketball coach how you doing thanks for joining I'm me good. today i'm doing well man i'm doing well thanks for having me absolutely absolutely so um we'll get right into it you know, you had some successes, but you had a lot of struggles this year. Why don't you tell me about how this season was for you this past season, what it was like? Obviously, tell me a little bit about the triumphs. Tell me about the struggles and kind of how you feel about all that. Yeah, this season was a grind. Um, you know, it, we we obviously went into the year with high expectations um, with some really talented players, pieces coming back and felt really good about our chances to make a really good run in the conference and, and have a chance to be playing um, in March and, and postseason NCAA tournament. And, you know, that was the ultimate goal. Um, we got derailed uh, about halfway through our non-conference season and just hit some bumps that we really, really couldn't recover from. Um, it was kind of tough from that standpoint, or it took us longer to recover from, I, I would say. Um, you know, part of it was we had some injuries early, um, and then, you know, got into a groove early in the season. We started out and, and, and through five games, had the best record in school history. So we, you know, felt good about ourselves from that standpoint. I think we started trying to integrate some of the pieces that were out back into the mix, which, as you know, probably takes a little bit of time uh, once you get into a little bit of a groove. So that kind of set us back a little bit. And then, um, you know, it's, it, it, it was tough because we never really got ourselves into that offensive rhythm that I thought we relied on throughout the last couple of years to kind of stem us to our, our success. Um, we had to kind of change our identity a little bit as the season went along. Uh, we became a much better defensive team. Our defense kept us in games. Yep. We had to grind out games. Uh, we went from being a volume three point, not even out. You know, we always shot a lot, but we made a pretty good percentage of them. So volume three point making team, to having to really pound the ball into the post a little bit more and, and play through our inside game, which one of the things that made us has made us very unique over the last couple of years is our ability to score and beat you in different ways. You know, we can shoot the three, we can get out in transition, but we also had the ability to pound the ball inside and score through the post. And I thought um, as the season went along, we relied, we had to, we had to rely on that a little bit more because we weren't shooting the ball as well as we, 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 we were accustomed to. And so those adjustments, and I think, you know, we adjusted well as the season went along and uh, we were playing our best basketball towards the end of the year for the, the way we needed to play. Got us an opportunity, you know, got us the first round win in our conference tournament, got us to that second round. And then we uh, we matched up with that buzzsaw at Gulf Coast that um, has been a, is a yeah. challenge for everybody. Thought we played well, did some really, really good things. But ultimately, um, you know, we, you can't trade threes for twos. And that's pretty much what it came down to. Uh, we relied on our inside interior presence and got and generated some really good stuff. Um, but they made a lot of threes and, and that obviously counterbalances things from that standpoint. So, you know, we had a lot of, um, you know, individual accomplishments that really proud of, you know, uh, jazz led by jazz bond. I mean, you know, one of her goals when she first got here from South Florida was she wanted to be the all time leader in blocks. She wanted to be the all time leader in rebounds. She wanted to be the all time leading scorer. And she did all three of those things this past year. And um, so special from that standpoint, um, you know, she was defensive player of the year, second year in a row, um, you know, um, and first team all league. And, and, and then also, all, all um, you know, made the all academic team also. So doing it both on and off the court. So, you know, excited about that, you know, and as a team, you know, we didn't have a lot of success or as, as much success on the court that we wanted to, but we're still out in the community and still doing things out there that, and, and, and affecting lives in that manner. And we got the team out on team leadership award for our engagement out in the community this year. So, you know, it's not just about the basketball stuff. You know, we, we pride ourselves on recruiting good people um, that, that want to help continue to, to, to um, give back. And um, that, that I think we did, we did a pretty solid job of that this year and we'll continue to do that as we move forward. Right. Um, you mentioned Jazz Bond and the incredible job she's done in her time as an Osprey. Yeah. Um, also, we're looking at uh, Retta Moore, Yes, she's going to be moving on. You've got other players going on. This 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 program is going to look decidedly different on the floor next season. Tell yeah. me, what's your plan? You're losing a lot of firepower. You're losing a lot of veteran leadership. How do you, as a coach and your staff, kind of get through that? One in terms of uh, recruiting, bringing in more to replace that on court production, and also that leadership. What's your plan for that, coach? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's it, you're right. We lose a lot. Um, and the impact that they have, not just on the basketball court, but off the court, you know, what they bring to the table in terms of culture, in terms of accountability, in terms of work ethic, you know, they're consummate student athletes, people, the kids that you want in your program, you want to build around in your program. And so, you know, it's not, you, you can't replace that with just one person. I don't think it's going to be a group effort. We got a lot of spots to fill from that standpoint. But for us, it's about finding good people. Um, the basketball is the basketball. I mean, we know they got to dribble, pass and shoot understand that side of it but we also got that, that has to be coupled with them being good people got to be good character people and then they also got to you know have to be able to to, to be able to handle and do the work uh, we got a really nice academic regiment over at north florida that you know about sure. and um and and they got to be committed to to that academic piece too because that's about that's who we are and so those two things are our non-negotiables and then we go from there but my big thing is when you talk about the team and putting pieces together, it's about creating a picture, creating a, it's just puzzle pieces. And they all got to match. They all got to complement each other. They all got to kind of play off of each other. And I think that's important. And so for us, the challenge is going out and finding a, the basketball pieces that we think fit the way we want to play. But then also the making sure that that's um, that they're good people and fit what we're looking for with the off the court stuff, too. But I also think, too, like part of it is be, having flexibility um, because we've played a certain way, but we may have to adjust how we play a little bit to match the people that we get in based on their skill sets, coupled with the, the type of personalities and character that we're looking for. So, you know, that's something that we have to be open to, which is, is, is can be exciting, too, when you think about it. Right. So the two things you mentioned um, first was that you're you are looking to recruit people and maybe you may have to tweak the way you guys play next year yeah. in order to make it better fit your personnel and as a coach i think that's pretty good because you know this better than i do a lot of coaches say this is my system i'm only recruiting players that play in my system and we're gonna play it how i coach it so yeah. you're already showing that you know flexibility as a coach to say the type of players i get may dictate more how we play so there's yeah. that um mm -hmm. so i guess my question for you is do you have any idea right now of how you intend to play next year? Obviously, again, totally different type of roster and, and totally different players that that you're going to have when you line up for opening tip, tip next yeah. year. Yeah, I think, I mean, I know right now, uh, you know, when you think about big picture wise, I know how I want to play. Yeah, that's, you know, we play with space. Uh, we want to move the ball, big component of ball and body movement. Um, don't want players that are going to stall the game out and play iso ball and just dribble it to death. Um, you know, I want the ball to move. We've been very ball screen heavy um, over the last three years. You know, we're setting two, three ball screens every single possession down the floor for the most part. And I've had a lot of success with that um, and uh, would like to continue that. But it might not be as much. You know, we may if we, we you know, it depends on how many attackers and how many people we have that can navigate ball screens. Um, that's going to be that's going to dictate it. We may need to screen more off the ball to get shooters open. Um, versus coming off of ball screens and having one person dominate or create for other people. So it's going to vary from that standpoint, but our spacing is going to be our spacing. I've always said, and it's, it's, uh, I think it's a Popovich quote, offensive spacing, spacing's offense. And so we got to be able to generate, create, generate cre and create spacing, keep our spacing, and then the rest will take care of itself. We've always been a program that teaches in concepts. And so, you know, we're going to, teach our players how we want them to play in different types of spacing and then um, and then rely on them to make decisions that are going to help us be successful on the offensive end of the floor. In my time being around your program, and I think I'm now going into maybe my fourth season around uh, UNF women's basketball underneath you, um, you have been and one thing you've been consistent with no matter the personnel is the way your team defends. You mentioned that before. They are active and you know, the, the the feet, the hands, very active, always communicating. And, and I've always admired watching that. But a big a big part of how active you guys could be defensively on the perimeter was knowing that you had Jazz Bond back there patrolling the paint and able to pretty much be the eraser and yes. clean up any mistakes. How much is that going to change schematically without her being there next season? Well, I mean, you're right. The thing that jazz does is jazz cleans up your mistakes, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, if you get beat, you got somebody behind you. And if she's not going to get the block, she's going to deter shots. 
She's going to force people to think twice. She's going to force an extra pass, which allows us to recover. Like all those factors play into it. Um, and, and so for us, we have to, the key to it is make less mistakes, um, be better when you talk about our rotations and, and, and how we cover for each other. Um, and then as we recruit, you know, part of that now is bringing in, you know, I th- I've always, I've been a believer, like it's, it's so hard to guard one-on-one now in the game of basketball. Um, you got really athletic, dynamic ball handlers that can really create one-on-one, create space and put a lot of pressure on defenses. And if you have one really good defender on your team, if you got two really good defenders, most people don't have three and four really good defenders. So there's a liability out there in reference to someone that can stay in front of the ball. And that's important because the more you can stay in front of the ball, the less rotation you create. And the less rotation you create, the less closeouts you create. And closeouts are, to my opinion, the hardest thing to guard. And if you're closing out all the time to people, then now you're, you're putting yourself at a huge disadvantage. And so that one-on-one defense for us, I think we're going to have to spend a lot of time on that a little bit more, probably more than we have in the past on it, uh, making sure our players are comfortable in one-on-one situations. But with that being said, our support around the ball handler has to be top-notch. And we have to be ready to anticipate, ready to support, ready to get out to the three. Um, this was honestly, I think, probably one of the better defensive teams I've had this year, which which is interesting because last year was probably one of the worst defensive teams I had this lot and since I've been here. And the interesting part about that is the personnel was pretty much the same. And so when you think about that, it's about, you know, how much time you put into the scheme, a better understanding of the scheme and what we're trying to get done and where we want to force the ball. But I also think having a really good understanding of what shots we are willing to give up. Because you can't take everything away offensively. Like you can be really good defense, but I'm a true believer of good offense beats good defense. And so bottom line is you have to say, okay, what shots are we willing to live with? Make sure those are the shots that we're giving up. And if we get beat with those shots, then we got to be willing to live with that. Got it. Um, what uh, in, in your recruiting, have you seen any type of players that you're excited about in terms of on that defensive end that can really – um, help you to continue to play the way that you guys want to play on that end of the floor? Yeah, I mean, we we are knee deep in the transfer portal. Mm. Um, and um, obviously, uh, we talked earlier about going to Juco Nationals and we're mm-hmm. going pretty much, we got three kids that we've signed um, in the early signing period that are okay. fresh. Um, you know, a um, kid from Iceland, a um, kid from Georgia, and then we got a local kid that we've signed. And um, so really excited about the three of them and what they're going to bring to the table um and and whatnot and so as we go and look in that portal and look at our at that our juco or transfer options um there are a ton of kids out there that i feel can help us there obviously length and athleticism helps or one or the other really good athleticism or really good length and being able to combine those two things and have those things complement each other are important for us as we kind of go through and obviously that'll be a part of our evaluation process as we will continue to roll but yeah there's a lot of talent out there a lot of talent across the country so many different levels uh the numbers are tr- are, are are gaudy at this point uh, but it's also about finding the right fit for what we want to get done who do you see that's coming back on this team that was that was here the previous season that can really step up and be an impact player uh, and, and a leader as well I got two for you. You know, I think Kayla Rogier was our only freshman on the team. Uh, really dynamic, athletic guard who can really create off the bounce, change speeds, change pace. Um, I thought she was on track to, to really have a good freshman year for us, an elite freshman year. And then she had some foot is- issues that kind of really set her back. And she got behind a little bit, struggled coming back from that. And then her first game, I think, of the season was against Auburn at Auburn. And um, and you got a freshman getting your feet wet and against a, a power five SEC school um, was a tough ass, but actually played well and, and actually progressed really well throughout the season. She's had a good spring so far. I love what she's been doing, working on her shot, extending the range a little bit and then learning how to use that explosiveness, her ability to stop and start and really create space. So I think she's set to have a really solid year for us next year and we need her to. And then Emma Broman, um, I mean, you know, her growth as a player and as a leader on this team, you, you can't really put into words, to be honest with you. Um, she is um, is totally committed to what we're doing. Um, you know, she's become a, a low post threat for us that we can rely on and go to. 
She's our best screener when, you know, if we're setting a ton of ball screens, she's really making contact and creating, helping our guards create advantages. So now we can force rotation and be able to play out of that. So she's a big key for us coming going forward. And I feel like she's set to continue her trend, which is upward and uh, being able to have a bigger impact for us next year. Next up, let, let's go ahead and uh, talk. You mentioned the transfer portal. <laughs> yeah. So two two big keys in in collegiate sports, male and female at this point, uh -huh. the transfer portal and yep. the NIL. Yep. Tell me how the transfer portal and name, image, and likeness are kind of, what's your take on them, how they're affecting uh, college sports, and more specifically, uh, women's college sports, because you don't hear about it as much, obviously. But um, what what's your take on it? Has it affected your program at all? Yeah, Talk to you me know, about that, coach. Yeah, you know, we talk about NIL. I mean, it, 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 you know, these young, these, these our players be getting an opportunity to use their name, image, and likeness to generate opportunities for themselves. I think it's a great thing. Um, it's affected us in a lot of ways. Um, not every player is involved in it. Um, I would say the player in our team that was that used it the most was Jazz. Um, and Jazz had a ton of opportunities that were literally sitting in her inbox that she couldn't use before that because it wasn't legal for her to. And so once this passed, she was able to kind of open those doors and revisit those conversations and really generate some opportunities for herself. Um, you know, I think it, 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 it opens up a ton of opportunities. It also opens up, um, you know, recruiting um, situations also where you get, you know, I'm, I'm having conversations with kids from the portal and kind of combining the two. And one of the questions is what kind of NIL opportunities are there at your in your city or in your at your institution and that type deal. So, you know, players are I had one, uh, you know, I had one player that we talked to that said that they made over six hundred thousand in, in, in NLI stuff last season and was looking to go someplace where they can break a million. You know, <laughs> so, yeah, that I mean, that that's that's the that's the side of it. You know, so people that um, are in locations that can take advantage of that and have the resources to do that and have the 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 environment to do that. I think it opens up doors and helps um, these young women kind of, you know, promote themselves and generate opportunities and then obviously helps in recruiting also. Right. And, and, you know, the portal, I'm actually going to look real quick because I want to give you a number. I mean, one second, give you a number here. Um, you know, we still got some time. I think the cutoff day for for being able to play right away, not 45.03, um, play right away. I want to say it's, May, it's sometime in May um, and um, want to give you a number of what, what it looks like right now. Um, I, I've kind of been in and out. We had a visit this past weekend. So today I haven't been in there at all. It's almost one of those things where if you refresh it every five minutes, you're pretty much going to get about five to 10 new kids every, every time you refresh. It feels that way. And um, and so it's 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 interesting because these these um, athletes have an opportunity to, to decide to move on and go somewhere else. And um, and then in most cases, compete right away, which is the huge difference in transferring. Transferring has always been there. But the big thing now is you can play right away. The other thing is usually, you know, before the portal, like it's kind of a double edged sword before the portal. Say you had a community, you were really tight. OK, I recruit a lot of your players over the years. You got a player that's transferring. You would call me and be like, hey, my kid's leaving. Are you interested? I would say, yeah, we go through the process and, and of getting permission to contact, whatever the case may be through, through compliance. But I might be the only person you call. So now, you know, there's not a whole lot of competition. You know, maybe it's two or three schools, that kind of stuff. Now it's pretty much a database. Everybody has access to it. It's the only way you can do it now. So it opens up the door, generates more opportunities and that kind of stuff for these kids. But there's 858 kids in here right now. Just Division One, just Division One. If I were to say take the divisions off and say all oh, just basketball, there's 1,377 kids in here. Um, and we still got till sometime in May before this closes. And people still can get in after May. But after after that deadline in May, they have to sit out before they can play again. Um, so that's pretty much how it works. So they kind of the, the deadline helps us because, I mean, at some point we got to know what our roster is going to look like. If there's no deadline, a kid could leave or come at any point in time. And it makes it a little bit different, difficult to plan and, um, and, and go through your season or get ready for your season. But 
that's what we got, man. It's it's a bear. It's a lot. And, um, you know, going through and finding kids, navigating kids, calling coaches, calling high school. And that's the thing. Everything happens quick. You know, it's a quick process. And, and for, for us talking about wanting to make sure we bring in the right people, part of that is going through a vetting process of calling and getting on the phone and trying to, you know, get some background on these kids. And um, that takes some time. And sometimes you lose some kids because of it. How many spots do you have open on the roster uh, coming up oh, this season, wow. Coach? I mean, we we are planning to probably bring in about, right now, about six more kids, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we're probably going to get to, my goal is to get, get us to about 12 to 13 and be able to play out the year and go from there. So we got quite a few that we're going to play with. And, um, again, trying to bring some players that can have impacts for us on or off the court. Got it. So let's let's switch gears a little bit, Coach. You've okay. been around this game for a while. Mm -hmm. How has women's basketball changed or evolved in the time that you've been around it as a coach? You know, I, I you know, you look at it a couple of different ways. Um, basketball wise, like on the court, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's it's very similar trends to the men's basketball. I mean, the men's side of it, the you know, the pro side of it, um, it's be, it's become more positionless. Um, I do feel like we actually still have a little bit more appreciation for the true post player on the women's side than in, in, so. in, on the other levels. I mean, you talk about your Nas Hillman's and, you know, um, Kunane's and and Boston's and those guys that are dominating the paint right now as as post players still having the ability to step out and make plays on the perimeter, but not shying away from that physicality and playing in the post and being a dominant post player that causes a ton of problems for people. Um, but I think it's about saying this about spacing, you know, spacing the floor, using the whole floor and being able to shoot the three. I mean, it's evolved just like some, just like the others, you know, for me, basketball is basketball. And, you know, it usually trickles down from top down with the NBA, WNBA gets to college, it gets to high school, but, in, but it's that trickle down effect that, you know, people see the trends and how players are scoring. And then it's also the attraction of recruiting in reference to staying up with the time. So you can have a style of play that's attractive to prospects who want to play at that level. And so for me, it's, you know, on a basketball court, we're shooting three more, you know, we're spacing the floor. People are playing with four perimeter players a little bit more um, instead of your conventional fours and fives. Um, you got your low posts. Um, you know, we're ball screening a lot more versus your true five out, you know, your, your motion stuff, which is now you're talking about ball screen reads. And the other thing is, I mean, we're bigger, we're faster and more athletic, you know, and, and, and our ball skills, the ball skills of players, their ability to ball handle and pass the ball is, is just like, you know, you know, everybody, the, the, the epitome right now, you talk about ball handling on the, you know, overall, it would be your, your Kyrie Irvins and your, your, your Steph Curry's, you know, and their ability to handle the rock. And um, and and, you know, everybody's trending for that at being able to do that. And we got so many players that that can really put the ball on the floor and create off the dribble and and put a lot of pressure on people defensively. And, you know, off the court, I think it, it comes down to, to investment and viewership. You know, you look we've been trending in the right direction for the last probably three or four years when it comes to, you know, um, the exposure of women's basketball, people watching the game. Um, getting all of our NCAA tournament games televised the last two years. I mean, all that stuff is is helping the game grow. Um, and it, it shows in the numbers um, versus from, from a viewership standpoint and also in the numbers from how people are investing in the game. So that's an exciting part of it, too, because I think we're just tipping the iceberg of where we're going there. So you mentioned that uh, you said basketball is basketball, and I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. if, watching the disparity, and I'm not going to sit here and tell you that I'm a women's basketball aficionado. I think mm -hmm. I have a solid grasp of the game, but yeah. just, just watching the difference between the men's game and the women's game. One, mm -hmm. I think X's and O's wise, there's a lot more schematic versatility in terms mm -hmm. of what the, the women's teams um, do versus mm -hmm. the men where it's almost always some variation of pick and roll on just about mm -hmm. every play. You see more actual offense being run in the women's game. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the question would be, why is that? I have my theories on that, but what's your thought on why that is coach? I, I think it's, it, it's, it's, you know, I think on the, when you talk about the differences for me, it's the, the biggest difference to me in the, in the sports are, are, the the ability to play above the rim or not play above the rim to me that's that's the only 
But when you play above the rim, it allows you to do different things. You know, I'll use an example. We talk about schematically and ball screens. Why are ball screens so hard to guard? Well, you, you, you're forcing two people to have to guard the ball. And on the men's side of it, if I come off a ball screen, you got two guarding me, I can just throw the ball up at the rim and my guy's going to get it and finish it. But I can't, that's not going to happen in women's basketball. So now it becomes when that tag comes to take away your roller, now it becomes what is your read? You know, and I think that's where it comes down to the tag came from the backside. So now I got to go to my throwback or my lift on the backside. They're rotating from the opposite corner. I got to try to get it over quick to get that one more to the corner or get it to the corner. So I think it's more so of a, a, a choice on the on the men's side in reference to I think they can do the same thing. They can be more schematically versatile and do different things and run offense and that type deal. But because of the athleticism and how hard it is to defend off the bounce nowadays, and you're forcing two people to have to guard one, now you're creating advantage. And for me, basketball is just about creating advantages. And that's the easiest way for them to create advantages. And they have the athleticism to be able to take that to, to really um, take advantage of those. Um, on the women's side, I think there's a lot more variation. You have some teams that don't have athletes at all, you know, and they play a certain way and play a certain way very well, which is, again, they create advantages different ways. And that is through ball movement, through body movement, through um, setting screens and forcing you to have to get through screens. But in the end, it's all the same because it's all about creating space and all about generating advantages. How do you create advantages for your team? And if I have a, if I have a player that can't create off the dribble really well because, one, maybe they're not athletic enough, maybe they're not dynamic enough off the bounce, but they can really shoot it. So now my advantage for that player is to try to bring them off screens and put them in situations where they're in closeouts so now they can use that to generate scoring opportunities, not just for themselves, but for their teammates. So I think it's a variation there of, of, of necessity in some situations or just honestly choice and preference. Um, because on the other end, you do have some teams that ball screen to death. Um, you're just not, they're just not playing above the rim. Their, their players are coming off and they're just making reads. They're making reads here or there based on who's tagging the roller or not tagging the roller. But I come off a ball screen and they go over the top and I dribble hold and keep my defender on my back. A pocket bounce pass to a roller is the same in women's basketball as it is in men's basketball. The only difference is in men's basketball, that might be a lob for a dunk every once in a while. Or I should say in their case, a lot of times, to be honest with you. And that's hard to guard because you got, you know, you got what we call a single side ball screen with someone in the corner. And I use that and they're lifting off the corner. That corner person has to decide, am I going to leave this shooter in the corner to go help on this roll man? Or am I going to stay on the shooter? That's, right. a, that's a conundrum in itself. You know, and so if you don't leave the shooter, you're you're leaving yourself susceptible to being getting lobbed on. If you go, you're gonna go back, throw back, and that Steph Curry in the corner gonna shoot three. You know, it's it literally that simple from a schematic standpoint. On the women's side, it's the same thing. It just might be a pocket pass that can be sometimes be a lot prettier than a, than a lob. Or and then you got your throwback action because they still got to do it from that standpoint. Thing. So to me, it's 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 honestly conceptually, it's the same. Um, how you generate. The, the advantages may vary, but it's about creating advantages and then taking and then and then leading those to those leading the scoring opportunities. All right. OK, so, coach, um, in, in the women's game and especially in college basketball, there's some super exciting players, especially in in the backcourt and, and at the wing position. Um, one of them, there's Kirsten Bell, who's probably going to be a top 10 draft pick this year. Mm -hmm. uh, she, you, you saw her a few times this year at Florida Gulf Coast. Too many. Few too many. <laughs> right. She's a killer. Um, there is the, the one who really has my attention, Caitlin Clark at Iowa, who yeah. looks like she's on pace to break Jackie Styles' Division One scoring record. Yeah. Absolute monster. Mm -hmm. Only player in, in college history, men or women, to have back-to-back triple-doubles. Mm -hmm. Um you got Paige Beckers at UConn. Mm -hmm. Tell me, who who are some players in, in the women's college game that excite you, that you like to – I know you're busy during the season, but when you get a chance, who's who are some players that you enjoy sitting down to watch? You know, it's funny, and, and you, there's a lot of players out there and and that you, you – get some you get to see. You, you hear about the Caitlin Clarks, you know, mm -hmm. Boston's, the, the Paige Beckers and, and – but, I, you know, being out West, I watched a couple of times now. And I'll tell you, I love Haley Jones from Stanford. Um, you know, uh, you talk about versatility and a kid, a player of her size that can do the things that she can do off the bounce and create and, and then her unselfishness to be able to find 
Um, you talk about Ryan Howard, Howard from Kentucky, you know, can flat out score and get things done at 6'2", playing on the perimeter and get like, like there's so many good basketball players that, that honestly don't get talked about a ton, you know, and, and, if, and then you go to that East Coast, West Coast bias, right. you know, so I, I thought, you know, Ashley Jones from Iowa State, like, you know, watched her play twice during the tournament, kick and flat out play, can shoot it, can post you up at six foot, kind of undersized from a, in, a, in the, but can do it all. And I think that's the one thing that's fun about the game is the versatility of these players. You know, you talk about being able to step out and shoot the three, being able to post up inside, being able to handle and bounce, take it off the bounce. I think it's, it's, it's been fun to watch just the overall development and progression of that development of players. You know, you got Ashley Owusu from Maryland, who's got an unbelievably strong frame and is a power guard that can get her shoulder into you and create space and really get in there and make plays. She can shoot it, but then her vision and ability to pass the ball is unbelievable. She's a perfect fit for that Maryland system. So, you know, there's so, so, so many good guards and are so many good players, period, that, that it's fun tournament time because you get an opportunity to just see them all on the biggest stage um, and playing at a really, really high level. And um, it's, it's fun. I mean, you, you, you can go on for days, man. Uh, you got the, got the Carolina uh, Henderson boss, you know, Z- Zia Cook. Like, I mean, it's just k- players that know how to play the game, play the game with a passion and an intensity. But it's not just about how much they can score. It's about putting their teams on their back and then making plays for them to get done. And then, you know, it's it's – it's been fun. It's been fun. I watch, you know, Texas Rory. Like I, I, I saw her maybe play once or twice up until the tournament, but talking about a freshman point guard playing like she's playing against like, you know, super seniors, giving them the business. Like it's, it's, it's the game's in really, really good hands when you talk about the type of players. And then it's the development as they come through and get into college. Oh, from what you're saying here, it definitely seems like, you know, the game is just being taken to another level. Definitely. What do you attribute that to and what's changing in the game that actually is making players better while not losing sight of the fundamentals? And the reason I ask that question that way is because I always hear it in the men's game, the game is more skilled than it's ever been before. And me, I've, I've been watching hoops since the 80s, NBA, college, all that. And I, I have a hard time personally feeling like the game is more skilled than it's ever been. I feel like mm-hmm certain skills were traded for others. I don't know for sure that it's more skilled. Yeah. And I, I think there's um, a, a dearth of fundamentals. And I think the one and done culture, the AAU culture has a lot to do with that on the men's side. But with the women's side, the game is progressing. The players are getting better, but they're not losing sight of the fundamentals. Mm-hmm. How is that happening? Is it because of the difference in athleticism? What do you attribute that to, coach? You know, I, I think it's I think, you know, in bass in, in on the men's side, you want to see two things. You want to see threes and you want to see dunks. Mm-hmm. OK, well, one of those you're not going to see in women's basketball very often, right. you know, and so you have to, again, have to find other ways. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where the fundamental aspect comes in, mm-hmm. um, because that is what we rely on consistently. When you talk mm-hmm. about the game being more skilled, I think that's it's kind of skewed a little bit. And the reason is I think people it's, it's said because you have positionless, the game's becoming positionless. Mm-hmm. And so you got bigs like Joel Embiid out on the perimeter handling and shooting the ball. You know, you got, you got um, Kevin Durant at seven foot mm-hmm. out on the perimeter shooting threes pretty much as a guard. I think that's where that, that, that comment, in my opinion, comes from because of the positionless basketball and players that couldn't do certain things back in the day are so much better at doing them now. You know, I think from a ball handling standpoint and passing standpoint, I think people, you know, they've always been really good ball handlers, really good passers in the game. That hasn't changed, but there hasn't been always been this big that can step out and be play guard like. And I think that's where the change comes in. In the women's side, I mean, that transition's happening too. We got bigs that are playing gar- more guard like, but not at the expense of being able to just kind of keep stay true mm-hmm. to the core fundamentals. And I, what did I attribute it to? I think out of necessity, 
you know um yes we you know we got some we got some kids that can put the ball on the floor and create off the bounce and do some things there um but also you you have that a segment or an area where that's not um that's not being emphasized as much and then the core value of just being able to play the game in its purest form um is is probably a little bit more emphasized um and and probably simplified too uh, from that standpoint. So I think, you know, I don't know if that really answers the why, because um, I'm sure there's a lot of factors and a lot of reasons of, of why it's that way. But I think the guys just want to dunk it. Like you can get to the rim, you want to dunk. Right. I mean, right. you know, and for us, we get to the rim, you might, you might, you might get a layup. You might have to, you know, reverse pivot and hit a drag. You might have to hit a pitch. You might have to with hit your foot. You're not, you're not on 45 or 90 and on, on a, you know, as you're finding, as you're reacting to penetration to make a decision. So, and not saying that doesn't happen on the men's side either. Um, so, but it's just a matter of, I think it's more evident or more. That's what you see more because that's what we do. Um, so you as a coach, you have a few players who have gone on to play professionally uh, overseas. Yes. How, how does it make you feel as a coach to see a player that you recruited, a, a player who was with you, you know, yeah. and you watch them and help them develop to that level, and now they are living their dream and playing basketball professionally? Yeah, it's exciting. It, it's exciting, you know, and it's something to be really proud of. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's you know, outside of them getting their degrees and walking across the stage, you know, mm -hmm. you got these young ladies that have their hoop dreams and want to play professionally and want to play as long as they can. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember when I first got here to North Florida, um, that was one thing that was really evident to me. We didn't have any players that wanted to play at the next level. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in order for us to, to get this program, or I felt in order for us to get the program where we need to be, from a competitive standpoint, we needed players that had aspirations and wanted to play at that level. Cause I think there's a, a, a different kind of drive there. Um, if that's what your goals and aspirations are um, to continue playing at the, at that professional level. And so, you know, that was one of the goals of get going out and getting players that had that, that aspiration and to see that come to fruition and see those young ladies get an opportunity to go and play overseas and see the world and, and take advantage of their talents is, is special. And so I'm excited for that. And, looking forward to having many more come through our program as we continue to build and continue to grow this thing. But it's fun. It's really fun. And, and hearing their stories and, you know, getting up at odd hours to, to, to watch the, the live stream of them playing in those games and, um, and, and being able to talk to them about it and, and seeing the joy on their faces for being able to just continue to play the game that they love, I think is special. Right. Um, so what do you say to those people who say that they're basketball fans, but, you know, they don't give the women's game or, or the players who played at such a high level their due? Because in fairness, you do hear that a lot. Yeah, you do. I, I do say. I mean, I really I just I mean, for them, it's their it's their choice. It's their decision. But right. I mean, it's got to watch. I mean, I don't I don't I mean, you you to me, you, you can have a preference of I guess there's the entertainment factor. Mm -hmm. And as being a pure basketball fan, like, you know, and, and, and if you're a pure basketball fan, like we said earlier, a pocket pass to a roller off a ball screen is the same, no matter if, if it's a female or male, you know, uh, an inside out crossover and, and the defender falls on their face as you drive and you're going to a pull up or a step back, that's the same, no matter what. But I think a lot of times people have this misconception of, of what the game is and without even watching or giving it a chance um they they fall they they just kind of follow a specific narrative and that's unfortunate um but my thing would be come on let's sit down and watch the game a little bit and tell me you know and and you know and it's it's when they watch who they watch all that factors into it you know it's, you know you watch these, these the games that we just watched um last night and got a couple coming on tonight that if they watch they're gonna be pretty impressed I mean, you watched that Stanford game last night, the nine o'clock game. I mean, you're going, you, you leaving that, you know, wanting a little bit more. And so I think it's just a matter of giving it an opportunity um, and, and really going into it with an open mind and having an understanding of that basketball is basketball, you know, and that's, that's my approach to it all. All right, coach. Listen, I appreciate it uh, so much for you taking the time out to come 
join me and, and talk hoops and talk uh, UNF hoops, of course. Yes, yes. Um, I appreciate uh, the, the different things you've given me in terms of opportunities to, to cover you and cover your team while I was in school and, and the opportunities you've given me since then. So thanks so much, Coach, and uh, uh, good to talk to you. Hey, same here, man. I appreciate it. I know we've been talking about this for a little while, so glad we finally were able to make it work. And um, I look forward to uh, keeping up with you and all the great things you're doing. And let's definitely make sure we stay in touch. Absolutely. Appreciate you, Coach. Have a good one. Right. You too.